Hello fellow YouTubers, I couldn't hold out, so Genius in Exile is going to open this from Bobby and make sure it arrives safely. We're bringing these to the meetup to hand out to everybody, but of course we're going to take a couple out ourselves first. <laughs> and it looks like we got a letter. The red peppers on top are Trinidad Scorpions. Some of the hottest peppers in the world. Ooh. The orange yellow ones are super details. And the red ones in the bottom are unknown. They were supposed to be scorpions, but apparently the seeds got mixed up. The peppers are very hot. Handle with care. Bobby. Look at that. That is beautiful. Aren't those beautiful? These are so shiny. Wow. So These are fresh. Here, let's leave this back. See if we can see row two. Ah, here we go. Oh my goodness, look at that. It's beautiful. This whole box is full of these things. Bobby, you are awesome. Thank let's, you. Let's pull back the third one. There we go. I should do this for you, shouldn't I? No, that's good. Wow. Oh. Beautiful. Three different colors. Just absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Bobby. Everyone at the meetup is going to love these. Wife, but not both. And uh, reading it to the other one seeds doesn't matter. They're, they're one master, and that's it. Uh, the uh, bull, bull master. Is a family guard dog. It takes everybody into its family, and even a even a two or three year old, it'll play with. It. You don't have to worry about the dogs attacking the two year old because it's part of his group, you know. And he'll protect it, even from mama. When mama hollers at the kid, the dog will get between mama and the kid because <laughs> they don't like any any disruptions in the family. Um, my uh, son-in-law would come home at 2 a.m. after uh, playing guitar in a band and smell a beer and cigarettes, and the dog wouldn't let him in the house. But, you know, protect him. Uh, um, I've always had a garden ever since I've been married. And uh, see, I'm 78 years old now. I know I don't look it. Uh, when I was out in California, I had a garden about three times the size of this place, and I did it with a tractor and uh, put in a sprinkler system. So I just turned one valve or one other valve and do different areas of the garden. Uh, right now, uh, living in town, I have a nice backyard, but uh, I'm doing square foot gardening now. And uh, talk to Bear Pepper about what you put in the, for fertilizer in the, in the garden. Uh, that book, Square Foot Gardening, I followed it to a T and nothing grew. <coughs> so I found out from Bear Pepper last time that uh, you need some other types of uh, gardening supplies, fertilizers, things like that. Talked about dogs. Um, I've got a question pinch. about the dogs. Yes. Do you um, I'm not. You pet them like this. You don't have to lean over. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Yes, I know they're big. About 120 pounds. I'm not really a dog person. Um, do you have to have two dogs? No. So that they no. can be companions, or is one dog okay? One dog is fine, and these dogs, even though they're large, they're. Uh, they, you can have them in, inside or outside. I've visited homes that where they had two or three dogs inside the house. They had no carpet and no, uh, uh, well, they had stick furniture. No baseboards. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. a bull massive. A bull massive. A bull massive. Yeah, they, they uh, Bull Mastiffs were bred in England, and they're a combination of a Mastiff, which is about 300 pounder, and a Bulldog, an English Bulldog, which is ferocious. They, they fight them and uh, that kind of thing. So a uh, Bull Mastiff 
she's in, is uh, about 120 pounds. They run from 90 to 180 pounds, but the average is about 120 pounds. And uh, they're real, they ugliest. <laughs> but I love them when they're the uglier the better because that's intimidating and I want them to be and that's part of their job is to be intimidating. So that uh, the neighbor, when we had some out there in California, uh, the first time the neighbor drove over on his tractor, he was sitting on his tractor and he saw one of my dogs, he turned it on and went back and never came back. And he just lived across the street. So he was afraid of them. And uh, in fact, he turned me in one time, thinking I was. Since I had so many, I was fighting them because they they are they're fighting dogs over in Japan, China. We're using for some fighting dogs, but here we don't. And, uh, so they're uh, they're real friendly. To the, you don't have to worry about them in the house for the kids or anything like that. We had a we had a kid in diapers, and. He had played with the dog. The dog outweighed him three to one, and uh, the dog would chase him and nip at his at his uh, diapers. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, when the kid would lay down and go to sleep, the dog would lay down and put his paw over. You know, his paw in that cute. Anyway, that's, that's that's a good dog. A uh, Doberman Pinscher is another dog that's recommended. I don't know much about him other than uh, uh, those, and uh, there's one other one. Uh, Rottweiler? Rottweiler. That uh, when the vet comes to work on them, he puts a muzzle on them. He never put a muzzle on any of my dogs. We had enough to where he came to the house and uh, gave them all shots, and they all looked forward to seeing him because he'd give them treats and pet them and Give them personal. They love personal attention. And when you put them in the car, they want to drive. <laughs> they want to sit in the lap while you're trying to drive. <clears throat> okay, Phyllis, uh, did you go to the cannery, cannery lately? I did. We're real lucky to have a cannery here in San Antonio because yes. I, I see on the internet a lot of people have to drive four hours to go once a, once a year or twice yes. a year. So where's our cannery at? It's over at 14 and Ingram. They're having a, um, a, a they've got a sign-up sheet over there yeah. for people to go. Uh, did you We've go? We've there several times. Yeah. Uh, what did you do? Well, I can. <laughs> you can? I did. What did you can? I canned all sorts of things. I canned uh, carrots and flour and cocoa and apples, macaroni, spaghetti. And it took you, what, two and a half hours yeah. for all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Not too bad. It's an interesting experience going over there. It is. Yeah. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you. So, what I've done here is I've got a little bit of this is just a prototype. I finished it about 9 o'clock Thursday night, so <laughs> bear with me. And I've never welded before, so that was fun. So, there's actually two different ways to do this. One is with a magnifying glass. And I'm going to show you with a Fresnel lens instead. This is a Fresnel lens. Big magnifying lens. The concept of this is you capture the sun in the lens. I'm so mechanically inclined, this just comes so naturally for me. I appear to be dazzled. Okay. okay let's see. So what you do is you capture the sun through the, the Fresnel lens. We had any. This is a parabolic mirror. Basically a mirror shaped like a bowl. And the idea behind this is when the sun comes through the lens, goes down into the mirror. Well, I usually have a stand for this. What it'll do is it'll actually shoot the heat up into the bottom so you can boil your, your food and then put it into your Wonder Box. Are you all familiar with what a Wonder Box is? No. Okay. What that is, it's basically two bean bags. One of them has a punt in it, so you can put your pot in there. What you do is you heat up your food to boiling for 15 minutes just to get it thoroughly hot. If you have meat, you have to have it covered in water, just so the insulation works. And then what you do is once you get 
everything hot and boiling. You put it into the bottom bean bag that has the plunge in it, put another bean bag on top, and it's basically insulated cooking. It keeps the heat in there. It'll cook for hours. We're talking five, six hours. Take off the top. You still need hot pads to take that pot out. Your food is still perfectly safe. It's over 165 degrees, which is a recommended temperature for me. There you go. So this is also what you would call stealth cooking. What you do is you get all your food hot and ready here, but don't put your spices in yet. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but go with me on this one. So when you get it boiling, put it into your Wonder Box, open up the top, throw your spices in real quick and close it, and put the top on. The way there's no smell. Because when you're hungry, you can smell food. And when you're real hungry, you can really smell food. That's the way for you to cook. Get your belly's full. Now, again, give away your location. This uses no resources, so you can save your wood for heating your home in the wintertime. In the summertime, you take your water box, put it out in the sun, keeps it hot, keeps your stuff cooking. There you go. I wish we had some sun so I can show you, but... Um, How do you build a wonder box? A wonder box is fabric and a bean bag building. Very complicated. Um, it's actually real cheap to do. You can order your bean bag fully online. Walmart has it for $12, or I think a huge bag. <laughs> We're talking like one of those big body pillows, about that size, for 12 bucks. I think it's a dollar shipping to your house. It's real easy to get in the same way. That's what I did. But there's patterns online. I don't have one. Somebody forgot it. I've seen that one somewhere online. But it's a very, very easy sewing project. Um, if you are not inclined to sewing, you can totally do this. If you really, really can, you can find fabric glue. This is not something you're really going to tear around and throw around. It's just, it's basically stationary. So once you get it put together, my idea behind this is decide whatever pot you're going to use. Try not to use one with a large handle to it. You want to make sure it's, you know, one that's kind of secure. That way everything can close around it. You seat your pot in the Wonder Box and take it out and then cook with it. That way you can have it already ready to go where you're not adjusting the, the filler in there and trying to get it around and spilling anything. Just get it ready to go. Um, the other thing I recommend is to put a zipper on it, if you can, or maybe some Velcro. Where well, you can dump out the filler if you need to wash it. But, uh, you know, you can put some newspaper in the bottom of the punt before you put the pot in there. So it's just basically insulated cooking. This is a way to use solar energy to heat up your food under heat. The solar ovens are great, but try making a pancake in a solar oven. Grilled cheese. I know we're going to miss those. This is a way to have under heat, just like you were cooking on a range. So there you go. Um, I don't even have a flashlight to show you, but you have great imaginations, your preppers. We have great imaginations. Those through here, down here, up under here. There you go. Does anybody have any questions? Did you, you said uh, you have a YouTube channel? Yes, ma'am, I do. Is that on there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Where do you get the uh, um, this one, of oh, this, uh, Green Power Science, they actually have a YouTube channel as well. We are trying like crazy, but maybe I should put this to two. But this actually cost me about $90. I'll probably find them cheaper, but I really wanted to support my fellow YouTubers. Uh, you can see it now up on the grill. You can see here. You can see it right here. Ah, right here. I don't know if y'all can see this, but it is lighting up here. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Imagine it really, really more powerful and really hot. You to kick it up much? No. <laughs> what I was going to do if we had the sun, I brought out a little jiffy pot. This has a black bottom. That's another thing. You want to make sure that the bottom of your pot is dark. If not, you can put a piece of uh, black metal and put your pot on there. You know, that'll also help to conduct the heat. Parabolic solar cooking. Okay. You said you have a YouTube video on this. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm Genius in Exile. Genius in Exile. That's an old high school name. It. It. I just. I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a seventy year old name. <laughs> 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 You're born in the seventies. Right? Former Navy. Former Navy. Actually, you can kind of see it in action. When I finished it uh, late Thursday night, I demonstrated it with a um, flashlight.
still kind of see it thanks to you. So this is how it works. It actually is very, very hot. It's like cooking on high. So you can burn your food when using this. So don't leave it unattended. I'm actually hoping to get this rigged up and perfected to where I can start pressure canning with this. Because it works just like a range. So if I need to reduce the heat, I'll try experiment with different, you know, metal on here. Because right now it's basically a direct ray. It's going to go to the bottom of the pot. I'm going to try maybe put a piece of metal on here and reduce the heat slightly or disperse it more evenly. This is still more <coughs> progress, but the people who first demonstrated it were Green Power Science. Just did a quick grilled cheese on it in a cast iron pot, which I highly recommend for something like this. But uh, I'm going to try to can on it. I'm going to try to cook on it. Because I was done so late, I didn't get a chance to do an actual demo. So I'm going to try to get that one up. Hopefully this or next week. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Where did you get your pair of boxes? Green power size. <laughs> and I just took some metal and welded a little stand. This will actually hold um, 30 pounds of weight. So I tested it with a 30 pound dumbbell. So if there's, are there any questions? Thank you, Jay. Hello, fellow YouTubers. Welcome to our live show. We've got our meetup going on. And uh, that was Genius and Exile just showing us how to use a parabolic miller. mirror. So right now we're going to have another drawing. And we're going to give away, I know it's tiny, but it can open. I'm going to have my beautiful daughter come up here since it's on camera and I'm not sure how other people feel. And we're going to give away these. Now, once you win one, I pull your name out to, and if we have more names at the end, then you go back in. Jen. All right. Yay. Lucky day. Congratulations. All right, folks. Well, everybody, let's say bye, YouTube. Bye, bye YouTube. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you at 12.30. Okay, we're all off air. Thank you so much for allowing her to go through that again. I was really slow today. She got better. She did. She went right through. It was good. She wasn't as nervous. <laughs> That's my G. She's awesome. Okay, so... Did you have some things that you wanted to demo or talk about? Ah, uh, go ahead for it. Okay. All right. Um, I lost my notes. Oh, oh. Now we're getting signed for door prizes. I don't think there's anybody new at this point. All right. Let's talk about. Um, we're gonna save that one for later. So let's talk about gardening. One of the things that uh, over these next few months, because our next meetup won't be until March or April, somewhere in there, um, is to get ready for your gardens. Everybody should have a garden. I don't care if it's a bucket, a raised bed, or a plot. Everybody needs to get a garden in now. You need to get experience with your soils. You need to understand the heat of the summers here and how to combat that. Um, mulch, got a mulch around here. Hay is cheap and it works great. You gotta watch out for the hay though. Not if you put it on thick enough. I've had hay on my garden for two years and I don't have a single weed. What's it called? Pickers. Pickers. No, no, no. Pickerant. You want to be sure there's no chemicals in that hay. Oh, well. That'll kill your garden. Yeah, well, you get the little dollar more expensive hay, but, you know, well, per bale, but it's still... You did that already, so... I think it mine was uh, $8 a bale. Where? But you still don't know if the... Farmers usually pick around to keep weeds and stuff out of it. That's the problem. Wow. So if that gets wet, they'll soak in the soil and kill everything you got. So far, I've had no problem. So I guess uh, it's not something they do a lot, maybe around here. Well, they do do it around here, unfortunately. We got, uh, they got the little junk bales that they put out for Halloween. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had pick around in. Yeah, I do feed hay. If you can't feed it to an animal, you don't want to use it on your garden. Because it can make your animals sick too. But do something. Leaves, you know, something. Put something on it. We have free mulch it. right uh, just down the street here. In town, you have free mulch. On my retreat, it's not here, so. Right. And I don't have a big huge truck to haul that stuff out. 
I have to rely on my friend who has a drug. Yeah, all stuff for me. But over these next four months, what you need to be focusing on is what is it I want to grow? And to get your seeds going, you know, get them ordered, find everything you want, find out the information on what you want to grow. I think everybody should be looking into moringa trees. Um, they contain such wonderful vitamins and minerals. You can eat every part of the plant. It contains 80 um, vitamins and 20 amino acids, and it's the only plant in existence that produces seven of the amino acids that only your body produces. If you harvest the leaves in summer and harvest the leaves in winter, you get different vitamins in each season. And uh, they, even if they get frosted and die off, they'll come back up the next year. If you let them go, they'll grow to 90 feet and they're really straggly little plants. So when they get to be about three foot tall, you want to cut them off to 12 inches. Yes, sir. Can you grow them in a pot? You can grow them in a pot, absolutely. Remember they have, um, what is it called when they put down that center root? Taproot. Taproot. So you want to make sure you're working with a deep pot. It doesn't have to be wide, it has to be deep. And it's very important to chop them off, otherwise they're going to be really straggling, you won't get hardly any leaves. So when they hit three foot, chop them down to 12 inches, then let them come up. And then at that point, you don't want them to get any higher than what you're willing to harvest from. Because once they go way up, They'll go up to 90 feet and you won't get any leaves because you won't be able to reach them. They're great for deer if you have deer on your property. They're great for that. Um, all you do is you pull the leaves off or the bark or the root. You can boil the root like a potato. You can skin the bark off, dry it, grind it up, put it in your food, the leaves, dry them, grind them up, eat a teaspoon a day, and it'll change your health. This is what they're using in Africa to combat um, the starvation over there, they now have moringa fields. And so wherever there's, they're having problems with the, the kids not getting enough food, they've implemented these moringa trees and the kids are doing amazingly well. So it, it's something we all need to have on hand. Things get tough, you know, you're at least getting something. Also, one thing that a lot of people don't think about is sprouting in the winter. You still need your veggies in the winter, Prices in the grocery stores are going up, and the quality of what you're getting in the grocery store is not very good at all. Sprout your wheat, sprout your broccoli seeds. Um, you can also take your broccoli seed sprouts that you buy and plant them for your broccoli next year. Same with wheat and everything else. But sprout those. All you do is you take a mason jar, the ring from the mason jar, and a piece of screen. Actually, two pieces of screen. Kind of offset them a little bit, shove it in there, cut around it, put your sprout seeds in there, put water over it for six hours, drain it, and then twice a day just rinse them with water. Lay it on its side and in three days you'll have these wonderful nutty sprouts. Very good for you. It's a way to get all those vitamins that you wouldn't normally get in the winter. We have mild winters. We can usually grow a whole lot more in fall than we can in spring. So now's when you should have your gardens in. Garlic should have went in last weekend. Or cabbage or broccoli, you cannot plant seeds right now. It's already too late. You need to do plants. But they have the plants for sale. And when you go to Lowe's and stuff, you're going to notice they have tomatoes. They have hot peppers. Don't buy that stuff. It will not grow. You won't get a harvest out of it before we hit a freeze. It just, it's just not worth it. But broccoli cabbage, cauliflower, celery does great, uh, radishes, carrots, spinach. beets, spinach, spinach. Uh, it's a little too late for sweet potatoes. You might still be able to get a harvest of sweet potatoes at this point. Depends on when our frost hits. Normally that's January, February, so just mulch really good as it gets colder and you'll do perfectly fine. So but get everything planned because you're going to start getting everything ready in January, February. So you want to be ready so it's not a mad rush for you. So you get a much better garden this next coming year. How long do carrots take? Carrots take 60 days. Oh, okay. Which is nothing, yeah. And they're better in the fall. Yes, oh yes, so much better in the fall. But get the kind of carrots that go with your soil. Don't get the big long carrots if you've got soil like I got that's full of rocks. You want to get the Dante's, the little tiny ones that are fat and short, so they don't try to make big long taproots because you'll never get them out of the ground. 
So keep that in mind with what you're looking at. Same with beads. Don't get those that have the really long cap roots in them because you're going to have a heck of a time getting them out if you've got rocks like I do. Because as you know, my some of you know, my property was nothing but rocks. And uh, we spent a lot of time getting the rocks out so we'd have enough soil to be able to plant something. So you can make it grow anywhere. You've just got to put the time and effort into it. Any questions? I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Don't forget snow peas. Ah. They, they grow really well starting right now. And not only do you get the snow peas, well, you can raise regular peas too. I'm just too lazy to shell them. So I get the snow peas that you can eat the shells. But both of them, not only are they growing, but they're also legumes that are no, nitrogen fixing and they'll increase the nitrogen in the <laughs> soil for the next thing that you plant, like next spring, in the same place. Very good. Yeah, I planted four rows just last weekend. Yes, sir. Uh, and also, we found out we had a problem with uh, fuzzy tree rats getting all of our uh, uh, squirrels. Okay. Uh, getting all of our tomatoes. We found out that if we, when we harvested our garlic, if you cut the roots and the tops off and sprinkle them around your tomatoes, squirrels will not bother. Oh, nice. And you harvest them just about the time that your tomatoes are being planted in the spring. Right. So when you cut, you know, when you harvest your garlic and you cut off all those parts, just so make a bad. mess in your garden. I know my nice and neat garden didn't look too neat anymore, but it kept the squirrels from taking all the tomatoes. Well, it's mulch, if nothing else. Yeah. Yes, that's it. You named three things last time, molasses powder and two others that you use in your for fertilizer. I use molasses powder. I use, um, camp. Gotcha. Uh, I use um, lime, Epsom salt. There was something else that I used. I think that was it. Epsom salt, lime, and molasses powder is the only things that I used in mine. And um, for some, some vegetables, it really doesn't do much for. We, as you saw, the potatoes, it didn't do anything for potatoes. So we have a local station, KPSA, here in town that has an organic gardener yes. every Saturday and Sunday. He, he talks about when you plant your tomatoes to take was Epsom salts, put in the bottom of the hole, right. then plant your tomato and make a much stronger plant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and for around here, if you're going to plant potatoes, it is recommended you do purple potatoes or sweet potatoes. Those are the ones you'll get the greatest harvest from. The regular russets or the white or any of those, they don't do really good here because of the extreme in temperature. But the sweet and the um, purple potatoes are what you can do. If you plant sweet potatoes and don't get them all out, they will come back and just take over our area. Yeah. We planted a small area, probably a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger than this tabletop. Now it's covered probably one third of the oh, nice. one or two. I percent. wish I had that. I, I love things that replant themselves every yeah. year. You know, we just missed them. You just, know, when we were digging or, or just cook up your sweet them. potatoes, mash them, dehydrate them, and you've got instant sweet potatoes. They are so good. Put them in a bread. You got sweet potato bread. It's really good. I made sweet potato waffles. So do that with your pumpkin. Pumpkin season. Um, they normally reduce the prices the day before Halloween at HEB and all the other stores. So you can get them for like 99 cents, a dollar, that big. Um, <coughs> if you go out on 16 to Hondo on your right, there's a big pumpkin patch. Prices go way, way, way down. And you can get 20 of them. Throw them in the oven, bake them, smash them, dehydrate them. You got pumpkin for a long time. So don't let that stuff go to waste, okay? Multiplying onions also. Multiplying onions. I planted some of those. Yeah. So. They, uh, you grow them up, you dig them up, just break several plots loose, stick them back in the ground. They'll keep multiplying. If you forget about them, they die out, don't pull them. Just cover them up with a little bit of dirt. They come right back out next year. All right, let's do another drawing. Everyone game for another drawing? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, Jeannie, do you want to do something for a drawing? Yeah, she would like to do it. Okay, well, do you want to do one of yours? Uh -huh. So you, you, you do it. Okay. See, I get a breather this time. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I got a breather. Okay. Let's see. Let's laundry soap base bars. Mm -hmm. Stuff I made myself. I have a video where I showed how to make laundry soap. This is actually a couple of the bars. Break these up and use this in your washing machine or on your washboard if you have one. So a couple of bars in here, just real simple. Mm -hmm. Just make
make sure you leave it out of the box after you fill the name. <laughs> no, not that way. Find them off. Glenn. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm always ahead of schedule. Seven. All right, I'm going to do one more demo, and then we're going to have a little bit of time to mingle and, and talk to each other and get to know. And if you haven't filled out a sheet, all that sheet is for is for the drawing. You can put as much or as little information on it as, as you're willing to share. But fill one out for family and slap it in the box so you can win a prize, okay? And we even got a donation for any bread the healthy way that we'll do here in a few minutes. Grandma's Inflation Fighter is my most favorite, favorite book if you have not read it. Awesome recipe. Where can you get it? You can get it at Breaking Bread the Healthy Way. Do not order it from the author online. Breaking she bread. never contacts and she'll keep your money. So, Amazon or Breaking Bread the Healthy Way. They're on uh, Jackson Keller. 210 Jackson Keller. Yeah, you need to find mine. Oh, nice, nice. What's the book cost? You want to help with the toilet? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry? How much is the book? The book? Sixteen. Worth it. Yeah, it really is. That's where I get my bouillon recipe and everything else out of it. My brain got a cookbook called my brain. Oh, that's more than a cookbook. It's a freshener. Freshener. All right, so we're going to talk about toilets. Um, on my, one of my radio shows, we talked about it, and there was such great interest, I decided that maybe we ought to show it here how to do it the easy way. So let me get something. Okay, so all you do is you find a spot, preferably a rocky spot if possible, on your property, and you're going to dig yourself a four foot by two foot by at least one foot deep hole. Okay? Now, the important thing with a toilet is to remember to keep the urine out, if at all possible, and only use it for the other stuff. Because the urine is what causes the smell. And so as long as you can keep the urine out of it, you don't get that horrible smell. Now, for men, that's really easy. For women, you need to get um, one of those go girls or learn how to go standing up to make it easier on you to do it when things you don't have a toilet. Do not go in the toilet if electricity goes down unless you have a septic because it will back up. It may take a little time, but if the electricity goes down after four or five days, the sewer system is going to start slowing down and shutting down and all that stuff is going to start back again. So that, I think that's going to be our biggest issue if we have a solar flare that knocks out electricity or something. I think that's where the biggest issue is going to be in the city is the toilets and the sewer systems backing up and people just going wherever. And a prime example of that is when we had Katrina. What did that dome look like? Where did they go? What did they do? They went wherever they were. They didn't care. So keep that in mind and, and you know, let's prepare our, our sites well. So you're going to dig the two foot by four foot by at least one foot deep. Then you're going to have yourself a little board like this one. And it's just a two by, I mean, a piece of plywood with a hole cut in the center. Wide enough to cover the one foot hole. And so you're going to lay it on. Go ahead and lay it on. And then you're going to get a bucket. And you're going to take your bucket and you're going to cut the measurements of your bucket. You're going to take the top, mark a circle, take the bottom, mark a circle, and cut out a quarter inch or halfway. It's about halfway in between the two of them. Because what you want it to do, you want to go that side, is you want it to go in. Okay, let's turn this way so you can see. You want it to go part way down. What that's going to do is that's going to 
hold your bucket stable. Okay? You can also hook brakes, but this will lay on either side and that'll be in the center. So it'll stay up. You're gonna take a trash bag. And the only reason we do a trash bag is for sanitary reasons. And you're just gonna cut off the bottom of your trash bag. And you stick your trash bag in the bucket with the bottom cut out. And all it's doing is protecting your bucket so if something sticks, you don't have to be scrubbing your bucket all the time. You can either get one of these bucket toilet seats. I think they're um, $9 is what I paid online for it. Or just get a regular toilet seat. You can get a regular toilet seat and just cock it onto it. It doesn't have to be a special toilet seat. The reason I like this one, it has a rubber gasket. So when you close it, and actually lock it down for smells or transporting. We don't need to transport it because there's nothing in it. So we just locking it down for smells. And this sits right on the top of the bucket. I'm not going to push it on, but it does. And so someone comes by, they use the toilet, you have your dirt that you dug out of the hole, they grab a handful, they throw it in, they close the lid. When that's full, you pick up the board, slide it, and start over. That way you don't have to be digging every other day. It'll probably last you, depending on how many, it could last up to a month. And as long as you're not urinating in it all the time, you don't have to worry about the smell. So think of these things now, because if you're in a home in town, you got to find a place in your backyard. Can't be near running water. 50 foot between your water source and your toilet. It can't be at the downhill slope. So if you have your toilet on the top of the hill and your water's on the bottom of the hill, that's not a good scenario. Not near your garden. They still haven't proven that compost of human waste does not make you sick. So you want to put it on your trees, you can compost it, you can put it on your trees and that kind of stuff. But don't put it on your garden, unless we can have somebody who's finally gutsy enough to try it. Did you have something to say? Okay. There's some um, off over there. If anybody's got mosquito issues, help yourself. So, anyone have any questions? I have a question. Have sure. You, have you heard of anybody burning the, the poop? I don't recommend it, because then you're releasing spores into the air. And that's, you don't want spores around where you're at. You know, that's, I'm sure it would be like salmonella, you know. And you should always have something to clean your hands near your toilet. Very important, especially in an SHTF situation because everybody's going to be dirty. One of the other things that's important, you should always clean your private parts, your um, armpits, and your hands every day. That's what is what will keep you healthy. Your health won't matter. I mean, you can go a month without washing your full body or washing your hair without making yourself ill. But your armpits, your private parts, and your hands, those are the things that are going to make you the sickest. So very important that uh, people learn to wash their hands. And so you, you've got to start planning for that, a uh, way to do that. Whether it's with rainwater or it's that... Uh, soap free stuff or however you want to do it. Anything else? I heard that diaper wipes work good. They do, but the problem is diaper wipes will dry out within a year, maybe two. So rotate them. Right. If you rotate them, absolutely. To me it's a space issue. I would rather take a roll of paper towels, cut them in half, get me some soapy water. You put them in a coffee can the half roll of paper towels, pour some soapy water in there, cut an X in the center top of the can, pull the center of the paper towel roll, the first one on the center up, and you've got instant hand wipes. And you can use them for other things too. So I store paper towels instead. Did you say that there was any chemical that you put in there? I don't use chemicals. Just dirt? Just dirt to cover it. It will compost. And then, of course, once you move this on to a new spot, you want to mark the old spot in some way so people know that it's going to settle. 
but because you're only doing the hard stuff in there, it's not going to settle as if you were doing urinating. Now, for the urinating, men should use, or people should use the same spot every day. Each person should have their own spot. They should use that spot. You should have a designated area. Um, use it for one day and then move. One day and move. Because that one day is, anything more than that would be too much money for it to compensate for. So, one day and move. One day and move. Even if it's two foot away, that's fine. So have your designated area. And it's, it's always better if you can have a female area and a male area, you know, or something like that. Now, in my situation, we have over 20 in our retreat group, so each person has to have their own. We can't put one place for three people. It, it would just be too much ammonia. And you will be dehydrated, so you won't be urinating as much because you're not going to have free rain of water. Yes, sir? I was just wondering, would it work if, um, for the males anyway, they get like a bottle and urinate in the bottle, say every day until it's full. I mean, every, every time you use it, right. you cover it up. And at the end of that time, it goes somewhere and just... Yes, you can do that. Um, but I don't want to be carrying my urine around. I'm going to have enough other stuff to take care of, dealing with food and cooking. And, and I don't want, you know, I mean, if containers can be spilled then it gets spilled in the wrong way, and then when you touch it, if their hands were dirty, you're producing salmonella or whatever elsewhere. So it's, it's better just to find your spot and go. And everyone should have a ration of toilet paper. You know, that's your daily ration of toilet paper. You carry it with you when you're out. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. There's some leaves, you know. Because some people do use a lot of toilet paper. And uh, you can go through that stuff really quick. Four squares maximum. It's the rules. <laughs> Otherwise, leaves. But hopefully, we'll never get to that kind of situation. That's not what this is about. This is about preparing for anything. So, but we like to cover this stuff because a lot of people don't think about what are their other options if something were to happen. You know, we're in solar maximum right now. Who knows? Get a solar flare that just happens to be crazy. They have it. I think, didn't they say like 90,000 years ago we had one? Or was it? No, it was before we got into too much electronics. It was back in the 40s. 1850s. 1850s. Thank you very much. Yeah. We had one that would have wiped us all out for electrics, you know, electronics and electricity and everything. So it's not unheard of. So it's good to be able to be prepared for that kind of stuff. Anything else? What are those? Pickled eggs. Pickled eggs. Lazy man pickled eggs. Yes. Get pickle juice and drop in an egg. Really? Yep. Works good. I remember making rubber eggs. You take vinegar, drop an egg in, and then you got rubber egg and you throw it at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> or rubber pencils. You know how that goes. What? Oh. Oh. you lose the whole center. But normally you're talking 20, 30 years, you know. I mean, it's vinegar. It's so after 10 years, they're still good, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, if it's got those new lids, I would recan it. Because those new lids are only quarter turn lids, and then they pop off. And somebody accidentally hits that. I just had that happen out in my shed. I decided to reorganize it. No, not a good idea. Um, you really shouldn't reorganize your food storage, your jars, because they're very delicate. And, you know, all bands were off, and I was trying to slide them in and knocking them. And I went out a couple weeks ago, and I had black bacon. So if you're ever unsure of whether or not you can tell it's gone bad, you can always tell when something's gone bad. You're not going to guess at it. <laughs> 
you're going to have flies, you're going to have smell, or you're going to have color change. So don't be messing with them. Kind of put them in one place. Don't be knocking them. If you know that you're going to be moving stuff around, put the rings back on. Move them and take the rings off. Keep them safe. Because there goes a whole pound of bacon. All right? Let's do another drawing. This was donated from Baking Bread the Healthy Way at 210 Vax Jackson. They were sorry they couldn't attend today. Uh, they just had other obligations they had to take care of. But uh, they've been great supporters of our meetups. They were here last time with a booth and actually went back to the store and brought things back for people that wanted to buy things. So that was really nice of them. And uh, they'll answer any of your questions help you out. They also do the bulk purchases there twice a year. You can do a co-op and uh, you can order, you know, your 50 pound bags of dehydrated potatoes or any of that stuff. That's usually where I get most of my stuff. And you can just bag it up yourself. Don't make the mistake of putting oxygen absorbers in with sugar, okay folks? <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. What about the uh, moisture? The desiccants? Yeah. Um, I don't think they have them there, but you don't have a problem with it. I've had mine. I actually did three buckets of sugar. I'm still trying to find the other one, which one's with. I did one with mylar in a bucket, one just in a bucket, and one with O2. So I'm trying to find the O2 one because I know it's a brick. And then the one with the mylar and without the mylar, absolutely no difference, no moisture in it. Good rubber seal on the lid, you won't have a problem. What would you do to the brick? Just put water in it and try to dilute it into a spot? Ice pick, break it off, and you're ready to go. Take a mortar and pestle, smash. You don't throw it away. No. Yeah, no, you use it. That's why I was willing to experiment. I tend to do that. I'll do things different ways to kind of show what happens. You know, what's the right way or wrong way, rather than argue about it. Well, you, know, you know you can grow your own sugar, though, too. I'm growing stevia, and man, is that stuff sweet. Yeah. It is. 300 times the um, intensity of sugar. You can, I, I've had nobody that said they could grow it from seed. Everybody has started it from plants here. But it's doing really good. I guess I'll see this year whether or not it survives a, thro a frost. And if it survives a frost, then we all have sugar is we'll just get some stevia and give it away here too. And then we'll have some, everyone will have stevia. Really easy, dry the leaves, grind them up. Eighth of a teaspoon is like two teaspoons of sugar. And it's great for diabetics too. So, I got it at Lowe's, believe it or not, in spring. It's a seed, yep. a seed or a plant? It's a plant. I haven't been able to grow the seeds, I've tried couple years and I've talked to tons of people that have tried and nobody's been able to grow it by seed. We're not sure why. They must be doing something to the soil that they're just not, it's not just, you know, it's not out there yet. So it doesn't I'm have just seeds, sure. but they just don't. Right, they just, I mean, no one's been able to get them to germinate. Stevia.net has some really great information no. about it too. Stevia.net is what she said. It's not genetically modified. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do a drawing and then we're going to have some mingle time because I really got to get something to drink. And then we'll, um, we've got another demo at 1230 and we're going to do that one live also now that I got it working hopefully my battery doesn't die. It probably will because I was a, you know what, I forgot to close it at least. But, um, and then we'll, we'll let everybody mingle a little bit and we'll do the demo and the live. And then we'll go into a few more things. All right? Cool. And uh, Sarah, you want to be the drawer again? Yes. Let, me fold, let me fold these in half again. So they aren't, they aren't magnets. You know how it is when something's folded different than the others? That's the one you grab. I know how you guys work. <laughs> okay. Sarah, you going to draw? Oh, G's going to draw. Go for it, Jeep. And I'd like to thank G for coming and helping, and we had Cena come help, and PB Prepper came and helped, and I really appreciate the assistance. So thank you.
And the winner of my favorite book is Ortega. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> Last name M. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. So everybody, mingle, ask questions, get to know each other, and give me a few minutes to free. Well, I got a temporary network problem, so anybody that's out there waiting to watch us, I don't think we're going to be able to go. So we're going to record it and move on. Alright. Sorry, Dee. It's alright. It's alright. Lily's here if it's not live. Oh, shoot. And that's about to die. So go ahead. It's on. Okay. Let me, everybody, this is Genius in Exile. She's going to do a soap, talk about soap, and then we got some soap things to give away. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, I just wanted to talk about making soap and the importance of having soap. As you all know, hygiene cleanliness is next to godliness, but cleanliness is the next step to health. As a bear covered before, there are certain places you want to make sure that you keep clean your private area, your armpits. And I mean, you want to keep as clean as you possibly can, especially your hands. Those are your biggest tools used to handle food and yourself. So it's, it's very important that you have your hygiene intact. So I want to talk about making soap. Uh, making soap is actually not scary. It's easy, and it can be done. Just a little bit of math, you can do it. A lot of people are afraid of lye. This is not to be feared. Much like fire, it can either overwhelm you, or you can use it as a tool. And this is exactly what this is. This is lye. This is an example of lye that you can find. Find at Lowe's. I buy mine at Ace Hardware. You want to make sure this is 100% lye. If not, that it has other minerals in there and chemicals you don't want in your soap. It can be very harmful. So this is 100% why. This is actually one of the brands that I also use. Um, with that, you can make body soap, you can make laundry soap, you can make one all-purpose soap that you can use for your laundry, cleaning your house, and cleaning yourself, your dishes. That's actually what I do. I use my own soap for everything. And it works great, and I'm happy with it, and I'm clean. I'm clean. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, you can use it to make bar soap. This is actually some laundry soap. Blend one, and uh, you can use this to wash yourself. It's very easy. This is actually a low sud soap. The reason why it's low suds is because you don't need bubbles to get clean. You need soap to get clean. What I do is I'll actually rub a washcloth on there. I have a scrubby, and I'll use that to wash myself. That way you don't use that much of it. You don't need that much. It's okay. It's really important to just you know get yourself clean by scrubbing. When it comes down to soap, there's just three basic elements. There's lye. That's the emulsifying. Uh, catalyst. There's water that you put the lye into. Do not put your water into the lye. It will explode. It's basic chemistry. Don't let that scare you. Just like if you put gas in on a fire, it'll blow up. Very simple. Put your lye into the water, pour it into whatever recipe you have, and you have your fat. There's lye, water, and fat. With those three things, you can clean everything you need. 